This is a video about reflection and appraisal for GPs and it's the first of two videos. This one covers a bit of the theory, questions and answers and some models. Uh, I'm a GP tutor, my name is Paula Wright, I'm also a GP appraiser and you can contact me on my NHS net email. You can also follow me on Twitter. So just a warning at the start which is that in this presentation there is some jargon and uh, I do try and use it fairly minimally, uh, only where the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. But please bear with me, do send me your feedback, and if you're finding it too much, let me know. So I'm going to start off with a statement from the Mythbusters RCGP document that I think is really helpful. Reflection, thinking critically about what we do, why and how, and where and when we do it, and whether it could have been done differently, is something doctors do all the time. It's a part of our professional training. So something that we're supposed to be doing all the time. There is quite a lot of scepticism around reflection and the effort involved. Is it a way to rationalise our flaws? What purpose does it serve? We already do it, but in our heads. It can't save time or result in any better outcomes. And is it just an unscholarly echo chamber or navel gazing? I try to answer some of these questions in this presentation. So can't we just do this in our heads? Well, there's a useful quote from John Sandars. He says that the process of telling a story, whether written or oral, requires the teller to notice and make sense of an experience. The presentation of the story, either private or within a group, appears to have an important therapeutic aspect which allows the learner to release emotion, an essential part of the reflective process. And individuals often require initial training to develop their sto storytelling skills and a structured approach is useful. Here's some more thoughts about the writing process in reflection. So writing is private, a communication of the writer with themselves until they're ready to share it with another. This makes it safer than talking. Since something said and heard cannot be unsaid, we severely edit our utterances, usually unconsciously. Writing can, to a degree, evade this policeman editor. It can be creative and rewarding, tending to increase self-confidence and a pleasure in practice. Sometimes, as an appraiser, I can feel uneasy reading a case review because of the level of reflection in it, and I know that in discussions with my appraiser colleagues, they sometimes feel the same. To try and pinpoint what it is that can make us feel uneasy, I've devised a, an acronym, STALE, that captures some of the key themes that come out of this discussion. So S stands for specifics, so in a case review where there's a it's quite vague and there's lack of specifics or details. T stands for talk, so it hasn't been discussed with anyone, there's no insight into differing viewpoints. A stands for no obvious action or change for the future, and L stands for no evidence of any learning, perhaps just a pat on the back, no reading context, and E stands for no insight into any emotions. Sometimes it's useful to try and see at what level the reflection is occurring and for this purpose I found Jenny Moon's grades quite useful. So at the lowest level we've got simply description uh, and uh, at the next level up there's repeating the details but without any interpretation. The next level there's recognising that something is important but not explaining why and at a higher level still there's a description of feelings, attitudes and beliefs. There's also questioning what's been learnt and comparing it to previous experience. The next level there's judgment, what went well and less well and why. And at the highest level there's a change to similar events in the future. There's an explanation, ideally in the context of references or resources. If things are getting all a bit jargon heavy for you at this point, here's a nice simple structure for reflection. What happened? What were you thinking? What were your feelings during and afterwards? What went well? What didn't go so well? What could be done differently? So there are simple ways to do this and sometimes starting simple is best. If you're looking for more authoritative models from different educators, here's a list of a few models that are well respected. In many situations it's important to keep to the four S's, keep it short, keep it shared, keep it structured and keep it scholarly. 
That means uh, bringing into it some context of reading or other references. Let's look at a simple three-part model for reflection. What, so what, now what? This is a model by Rolf et al. It can be translated into describing, analysing and action. And I've developed each of these categories a little bit further by uh, using an acronym as a checklist under each one. So the first step um, where you're describing, I've used the acronym HEAT because it links when, with the concept of being in the heat of the moment. You're close to the event, very involved in it, and uh, you're focusing on what happened, what emotions, what actions and what thoughts were involved. The next stage, you're stepping back to analyse, so the acronym is DETACH, and I'll go through that in the next slide. And the final uh, action phase, I've devised the acronym MOVE, which I'll also explain in the next slide. So let's look at this three-part model in a bit more detail. There's description, or what, analysis, so what, and action, now what. And I've done a little bit of reading around this and, and come up with a checklist of questions which I've summarised in this acronym. So HEAT is for what happened, what emotions did I have, what actions did I take and what were my thoughts at the time. Analysis for which I've got the acronym DETACH because it's about stepping back. So deciding what was good and less good, how have past experiences influenced my actions, time has this changed my feelings, what were the alternative viewpoints and what other choices were available to me at the time either from others or from research and reading. And under action, or now what, there's the acronym MOVE, which stands for Mastery Outcomes and Viewpoint. What have I learnt? What will I do differently next time? How has my viewpoint changed? And we'll be applying this in part two of this two-part video. Let's look at some of the difficulties that can arise in reflection and the solutions that might exist. So under description, analysis and action, let's look at the different difficulties. So under description, um, getting initiated in the reflective process might be hindered by lack of feedback or feedback not being constructive, by limited self-awareness when something significant's happened that has aroused strong emotions, or not being habitually a reflector. And so interventions that may be relevant here include um, working in a culture where there's a, a culture of giving constructive feedback, being mindful of uh, of your day-to-day -day practice and becoming aware of when an event has aroused strong emotions or provoked a lot of thought. There's thought catching, so um, uh, writing down or recording in audio diaries events as they happen. And also there's a motivational factor of self-efficacy, so having self-confidence or belief that you can be an effective reflector. In the analysis stage, there can be difficulties that arise through strong emotions blocking objective uh, reflection and leading to defensiveness, and also allowing the passage of time can affect memory and attribution. And this is something called hindsight bias, where your own uh, image and perception of yourself uh, becomes more positive over time, but may reduce uh, your objectivity. And possible interventions here, including uh, so reflecting outside of your head, so writing down or discussing to articulate your ideas, using structured frameworks, as we've discussed, trying to grade the level of, at which the reflection is occurring at to see whether you've taken it to the most um, uh, developed level, um, catching thoughts uh, straight away, and also recognising when emotions are getting in the way of objective uh, analysis of the uh, event. And then finally, under action, translating the insights you've gained through the reflection into actions can be helped by uh, seeing good examples, discussions with peers, being clear about what the goal of reflection is. Uh, so is it quality improvement? Is it identifying learning goals? And finally, recognising uh, whether you're intrinsically motivated to improve practice uh, or whether the main motivational drivers are simply passing, uh, jumping the, the hurdles of appraisal, for example. So let's look at uh, where reflection fits in with appraisal. So um, appraisal, if we look at it as having sort of four areas, there's the bit where you talk about whether you comply with good medical practice as laid out by the General Medical Council. There's your continuing professional development, there's all the documents that you submit, such as quality improvements, significant events, complaints, 
And then there's the multi-source feedback or feedback from colleagues and patients. And reflection uh, fits into all of these. So for the first one or the domains of good medical practice, you need to reflect on whether you're practicing in accordance with good medical practice and you need to include all scopes of your work. In terms of CPD, you need to reflect on what you've learnt and how you'll apply it. In terms of quality improvement, SEAs and complaints, it's helpful to think about it in three levels, a descriptive level, an analysis and what action is going to arise from it. And the same could be applied to the multi-source feedback. So when you're reflecting on your CPD, the outcome is your CPD log and the RCGB mis Mythbusters document says that ideally your CPD log should be a record of your most important and relevant learning throughout the past 12 months in a succinct and useful format. So let's look at how reflection links with CPD. So if you have a CPD activity you may decide either that you didn't learn anything or that you did learn something. If you didn't learn anything, you might wonder, well, did I misjudge the purpose of that activity or did the speaker misjudge the audience or the level of the audience or were the methods inadequate? If you didn't learn anything, is it simply because it's confirmed your current practice and what you already knew? Did you maybe seek that uh, learning activity due to lack of confidence rather than lack of knowledge? So perhaps that activity wasn't the best way to increase confidence. Would it be better dealt with by using case reviews or peer discussion. If you did learn something, what was it that you learnt and how can you put it into practice? What barriers are there? What aids and resources can you use? Templates and prompts? And will you implement it opportunistically or systematically? And have you understood it well enough to put it in practice or has it highlighted new and further learning needs? Can you articulate what they are? Will they go into your PDP, require any resources, support or time? Thank you for listening to this presentation. I really welcome your feedback sent to my email address and hope you consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thank you.